Hello, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, this is going to be on angels, part two, their purpose in the plan of the Lord. You have to realize that there are good angels and then there are the not so good angels who were originally created good but they decided that they didn't want to be under the rulership of the Lord hence Lucifer and his one-third of the angels and in the previous lesson I covered Genesis 6, Job 38, Job chapter 1. And people, you have to realize something. When the angels decided to rebel against the Lord, I mean, there was actual war in heaven. They tried to kill God Almighty. Didn't work. So God cast them out down to earth. So the war in heaven is now war on earth. Why in Genesis 6 did they interbreed with the women? They tried to destroy the seed line so that the promised Messiah of Genesis chapter 3 would be polluted. Let's take a look at that real quick. Now, in Genesis, I'm sorry, forgive me, Leviticus, uh, that was... This book was for the tribe of Levi. Levi was the tribe of the priests. They were the ones that served the Lord in the temple and in the tabernacle. And like I said, Judah was the tribe of the king. They were the civil rulers. Well, the Levites were the religious rulers. They were the ones that were to be the experts on the law. But in Leviticus 19 and 19, and oh, by the way, um, Somebody mentioned about numbers, uh, following numbers. Well, there's two different ways of looking at numbers. There's the Kabbalah way of looking at numbers, which is Satan's way. And then there is the Bible way of looking at numbers. Certain numbers pop up over and over and over in Scripture. Uh, some numbers are good. Some numbers are not so good. For example, the number six, the number... 9, 11, and 13 oftentimes seem to show up and it's not a good thing. Uh, the number 1, number 3, number 7, number 8, uh, number 10, 12, and 24, and 40 are good numbers that pop up over and over and over and over. There was a guy named Bullinger, B-U-L-L-I-N-G-E-R. He did a, a book called, excuse me, Numbers in Scripture, and he covers those numbers. I think five was a good number, too. Um, you know, I, I haven't read some of these books. I haven't read in, you know, 25-plus years. Um, I can remember some things about it. And, um, you know, colors have num uh, meanings in the Bible, too. For example, blue, the blue in the sky. Uh, they put blue on the hems of their garments. It was to remind Israel of God's law. So, and, um, you know, people disregard a lot of God's laws, uh, but they all had their purpose, you know. For example, uh, he said not to eat rats and vultures. I think that's a very good thing not to eat rats and vultures since they're full of disease. Uh, but if you want to think that, you know, hey, the Lord cleansed all meat and we could eat it and we're not under the law, well, that's, you know, fine. That's up to you. But um, if you eat unclean things that the Lord said not to eat and you get sick and you pray for the Lord to heal you, Mm, don't be surprised if he says no. Uh, it's just, you know, my opinion. I'm not trying to keep the law to earn my salvation. That's not the case. 
some things the Lord said to do and for reasons which sometimes we don't know. Leviticus 19.19 19. Ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Now, what do I, how do I come up with that? I think that he didn't want you to take your cattle and let them mix with horses or donkeys or sheep or goats. Diverse, right? Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. What is mingled seed? Well, you don't want your strawberries, pollen, you know, the bees pollinating the strawberries with uh, broccoli or the broccoli with the strawberries. What happens if you mix fruits pollen with vegetable pollen? Nothing grows. You know, it's a diverse kind. It's a mingled seed. You want your broccoli to pollinate your broccoli. So, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, I, I you don't want a brocca berry or a straw strocoli. So yeah, it's just, you know, I don't think cucumbers and carrots would even work very well. You know, cross pollination. I mean, let's face it, people. People will spend hundreds and thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, hundreds of dollars, maybe thousands of dollars on a purebred dog. People will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on purebred cattle, like if you're a cattle rancher. People will spend millions of dollars on thoroughbred horses but you're going to tell me they don't care about who their daughters and sons marry you know <laughs> really you'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on livestock but you don't care what your daughter marries you know you know the um the original purpose of a marriage license back in the days was when the state passed a law that interracial marriages were illegal and that's why people went to get a marriage license so that the county clerk could examine and make sure that both people were of the same race. That was the original intent of a marriage license. And then in 60, 1964, 65 or so, the Supreme Court said, you know, eh, those state laws, those are illegal. You know, that's racism. But you got to realize something. Back then, sodomites were not getting married. Abortion was illegal, and prayer in Jesus' name was in all the public schools where it had been for hundreds of years. Well, that's all changed. And now you've got interracial marriage, and the state will sanctify it. Of course, now, what is a marriage license? It is just a way to get for the state to get money, and it's a vehicle or an avenue of where the state can get involved in your business, so to speak, so that when a wife and husband don't get along, they can run to the court and file for divorce. And then you get some unsaved antichrist judge deciding who gets the kids, where the property goes, who pays who alimony, which 99% of the time is the man paying a wife for her ungodliness. Um, I'm not saying that men are perfect, but uh, you know, if you got a white male husband, uh, let's face it, all the cards are stacked against him in today's environment. The city that I retired from, they don't even like to hire white males. Matter of fact, they haven't hired a white male uh, supervisor in my department in. Um, the 15 years I'd been there. No, so what can I tell you? And uh, third world aliens get hiring preference. So, thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. 
neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. You know, God didn't like even like um, clothing with mixed fibers, you know, cotton and wool. Uh, there are people that says that it interferes with the electrical properties of your body. I don't know how true that is, but, you know, what can I tell you? God doesn't like mingled things. You could read in the Bible about kind after its kind after its kind many, many, many times. In Genesis 1.25, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 6.20, Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come upon thee to keep them alive. Genesis 7.14, They and every beast after his kind, and all cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort, kind after their kind. Let's face it, bluebirds hang out with bluebirds. Blackbirds hang out with blackbirds. Um, you know, lizards don't interbreed with snakes. They're both reptiles, but, you know, that's just the way it is. But that's why it was so bad in Genesis 6 that the fallen angels tried to pollute mankind's genetics. So, with that being said, um, I hope you learned something. Let us go to where an angel speaks next in Genesis chapter 21. Verse 1. I hope that clears uh, clears up a little bit about lesson number one on the angels, their purpose, part one. Now, this is part two. Genesis 21, verse one. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abram, Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Now we cover this previous part in part one. And Sarah called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Isaac bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac being eight days old. The number eight signifies a new beginning. You know, there's seven days in a week. The eighth day is the first day of the next week. It's a new beginning. Um, all right, so, and Abram circumcised his son, Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. I believe the word Sarah, the name Sarah, even means laugh or laughter. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, many of the uh, Old Testament names have meanings. I, I found that extremely interesting because... Oftentimes, it defined the character of the person who was named that. I don't know if the same thing holds true in the New Testament with the Greek. Possibly. I've just never investigated it, so I can't say yes, no, maybe, I don't know. All right, so. And she said, verse 7, And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given child children suck. For I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, I believe Sarah was 90 when she had this child. How many 90-year-old women do you know that give birth? Uh, yeah. I mean, this is not a virgin birth like Mary with Christ, but 
<laughs> it's still a miracle, right? Verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Now this was Ishmael. Ishmael was making fun of Sarah's child, Isaac. Verse 10, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So, Sarah's telling Abraham, tell this woman and her son to take a hike. Tell them to get lost. Verse 11. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Why? Because Abraham probably, you know, he probably loved his son. Verse 12. And God said, Ah, here we go. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. In other words, listen to her. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In other words, Isaac is going to be the chosen people, not Ishmael. Does that seem harsh? God makes a choice, right? I've heard people say that, oh, well, I don't believe in election, and I don't believe in the chosen people. Well, actually they do, as long as you call them the, um, the you-know-whos, the chosenites over in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. When, when you're talking about Christians, they don't believe in election, they don't believe in a chosen people. But when it has to pertain to the Antichrist, the you-know-whos, well, then they do believe in the chosen people and in elect people, which I find ridiculous, but, you know, hey, they don't have any logic. Oh, and they don't bother to read the Bible. You know, if my pastor John Hagee says it, you know it's true. Uh, I mean, that's their extent of their theology. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that's... That's it. But Jesus also said, love not the world. So which is it? Love the world or don't love the world? Well, God loved the world before the fall. That was the world that he loved. That he sent his only begotten son to redeem that world and the creation back to where it was. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Uh, that it might be on the earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because the earth's corrupted. For God so loved, past tense, the world. But he says, love not the world. Don't love this fallen world. And I'll tell you what, people. Matthew 24 and Mark 13, where the Lord warns about famines, it's coming true. About a hundred years ago, the kosher Soviets the Bolsheviks starved by the millions, the Russian people and the Ukrainians. And guess what? When they killed off all their farmers, and then they had a bunch of crop failures, because that's what usually happens when you kill your farmers, and then there was some bad weather, um, what, did the, what did the United States do? We blessed them by feeding them. We sent them wheat so that they didn't starve to death. God sent them a a famine, and we helped the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get the book Behind Communism by Frank Britton, B-R-I-T-T-O-N, and then look up the names of the top communists in a 1925 uh, U-ish encyclopedia and uh, look at all the names. You can't look at the, um, I think it's a 1917, uh, their encyclopedia, but uh, because it was before the revolution. The revolution wasn't until 1917. But the 1925 edition 
of their encyclopedia lists all the names. Matter of fact, look up the article on communism. I mean, you know, really? God's chosen people, huh? If you say so. But what they don't tell you is their God is Lucifer. So, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac's going to be the chosen people, not Ishmael. Does that sound unfair? Well, let's take a look. Verse 13. And also of the son of this bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. See, God promised Abraham he would be the father of many nations. And one little nation over in the Middle East, created in 1948 by the United Nations, does not many nations make. That's only one, and one is not many. So either God's a liar or the churches are teaching lies. Take your pick. I already know the answer. I'll give you three guesses, and the first two don't count. And also of the son of this bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abram, Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beer Sheba. I wonder if it was Budweiser. I know. Don't quit my day job. Um, I'm not going to be taking uh, comedianess uh, Sarah Silverman's uh, job anytime soon. I promise you that. If you don't know who she is, uh, go to YouTube, type Sarah Silverman, and then type Jesus. Get an education. Verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and set her down over against him a good way off as it were a bow shot. In other words, you know, you take a bow and arrow and shoot an arrow uh, about where an arrow distance away. And she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. Now, you know what? When you're in the wilderness, in the desert, and you're out of water, you're, you're in big trouble. I mean, let's face it. Uh, three days at the outside, you're dead. Verse 17, And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar. Ah, here we go. A voice, an angel of God. One of God's angels. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation." Guess what? There are between two and three hundred million Arabs in the world today. There's about, according to the Jewish Almanac, there's about 15 million of the Chosenites. So who is a great nation and who is not? I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count. For I will make of him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad. Ah. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Now, a lot of people don't know it, but Egypt is called the land of Ham. No, we're not talking about Smithfield. We're not talking about pork loin shoulders. Uh, we're talking about the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan, the father of the Canaanites. Ham was the one that looked upon his father's nakedness. And if you look up father's nakedness in the book of, I think, Leviticus, when you do a Bible search, it has reference to uncovering your father's nakedness, has reference to 
knowing your father's wife, not necessarily your mother, may perhaps a stepmother, I don't know, but it has reference to hanky-panky in the bedroom if you catch my drift. That's why Noah cursed Canaan. So, Ham, it was known as, uh, Egypt was known as the land of Ham. Uh, nothing good came from Ham and Canaan. Nothing that I know of. I could be wrong. If somebody knows, let me know. Show, Leave me a comment. But as far as I know, and oh, by the way, Ethiopia, from what I understand, is also from Ham. And God didn't have a lot of good things to say about Ethiopia either. Bloodlines, people. Bloodlines. All right. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Verse 22. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Pichol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I wot not who hath done this thing. In other words, I didn't know anything about this. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it but today. And, Abim, uh, and Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of, thy, of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Wherefore he called that place Beer Sheba, because there they swear, both of them. Thus they made a covenant at Beer Sheba. Sheer, Sheba. Then Abimelech rose up, and Pichol, Pichol, the chief captain of his host, and they returned unto the land of the Philistines. Now the Philistines were one of the tribes of the Canaanites. They were the giants. Um, one, the most famous one was Goliath, that David the king faced. Well, before he was king. And they returned unto the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 22. This is one of those wild things in the Bible. Verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Uh, tempting as in trying of his faith, testing, um, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. Thine only son Isaac? Why would he say that? Well, he was the only son, the chosen, only chosen son. I mean, after all, he, he had Ishmael too, right? But uh, he had Ishmael sent away. So here it is. Thine only son, Isaac. As far as the covenant's concerned, Isaac was the only son. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him, offer him there for a burnt offering. What? You want me to take my son and burn him? What? Say what? And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. 
Uh, can you imagine what was going through Abraham's mind? Say, say what? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Guess what? Doesn't this point towards God the Father offering his only begotten Son, Jesus, as the Christ? And by the way, people, Christ is not a name. It's a title. You know, Christ, Messiah. God himself will provide a lamb. Doesn't the Bible record that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world? Oh, yeah. Book of Revelation. John the Baptist, what did he say when he saw Jesus? He said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Oh, yeah. My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, Abraham had faith. Abraham, do you know Abraham was called the friend of God? I mean, can you imagine that? Being called the friend of God. Hey God, who's your friend? Oh, that's that's Abraham. Wow. So here it is Abraham's thinking that he's going to offer up his son. But I suppose he knows that God can raise him from the dead if he wants to. Or he could give him another son. Or perhaps he knew in his heart that God wouldn't let him break a commandment to kill like Cain did to Abel. But then again, when God tells you to do something, so there's no telling what was running through Abraham's mind. So, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. I wonder what Isaac was thinking. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now personally, I think God already knew this. But he was proving, now this is my opinion, he was proving Abraham's faith in God, having Abraham prove to himself that he would believe the Lord and carry out the Lord's wishes, even if it meant killing his only son, his only covenant son. But he told him, Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thine son, thy son, thine only son from me. 
Verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. I believe Jehovah Jireh, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but I believe that means the Lord provides, if I remember correctly. Um, I did a study on the names of God, all the different names of God, but, you know, you're talking probably 20-something years ago. I got a good memory, but it's not that good. It's not, it's not photographic. Verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Now God said he's going to multiply his seed, his children, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Now those of us that live in cities, there's not that many stars in the sky, but I tell you what, you go out in the desert where there's no cities for 30 miles in either direction, there's hundreds of thousands of stars. Just like I live in Florida, and you go to the seashore and look at the sand, there's got to be trillions, billions and trillions of grains of sand. There's got to be billions. And I'm sorry, but 15 million you know who's in a little tiny nation in the Middle East created by the United Nations in 1948 just does not fulfill those prophecies. But try to show that to the demon nominational church world and uh, mention that stuff and they'll uh, show you the door and threaten you with uh, trespassing and calling the police because they don't like you to th upset their theological apple cart. You know, the, um, the apple that Eve bit into in the garden, according to them? Yeah. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. Multiply as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together unto, uh, I'm sorry, went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, and Buz his brother, and Kemuel the father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Pildash and Jid Laf and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was Rumah, she bare also Teba and Gaham and Tahash and Makah. Boy, I'll tell you, i got to take a class in pronouncing Hebrew words one day, but I don't think I'm going to have time. All right, so I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, some of these people are going to be where uh, Jacob gets his, Isaac gets a wife for his son, Jacob. All right, let's uh, close this out. This is part two of Angels, Their Purpose. Um, 
I've got an entire playlist on the promises of Abraham. If anybody's interested, just click on my name on the YouTube channel. It'll take you to the homepage. Look at the top. It'll say playlists. Click on that. Look for Abraham. I got a lot of old material people from four and five years ago. A lot of old material. You don't, you know, you don't have to look at all the new stuff. A lot of good material there, I must say. I mean, I'm not bragging myself, but, you know, the foundations. Once you know who Israel is and who Israel is not, I mean, the Bible's pretty much an open book, especially when you pray the, the prayer of James chapter 1, where it says, ask the Lord for, uh, if any of you lack understanding, let him ask the Lord in faith. You know, ask the Lord to give you understanding. Be guided by his Holy Ghost, his Holy Spirit. Uh, he'll do it. I mean, I'm just, I'm just some guy that turned off his TV and spent a lot, of, you know, some time in the in the scriptures. That's all I am. I'm nobody special, believe me. Uh, you know. So, and besides, um, nothing I make is copyrighted. Nothing. If you want to copy everything and post it somewhere or keep it for future reference, please do because I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on YouTube. Um, the way things are going now, I, I have a feeling uh, Bibles are going to be banned soon. You know, I went to the Dollar Tree and, you know, they got Bibles for a dollar. Granted, they're paperbacks, they're printed in China. I don't know if they're 100% perfect. Uh, maybe there's changes in it. To, I don't know. But Dollar Tree has Bibles for a dollar. I mean, you know, go to the used bookstore, get some Bibles, put them away, hide them. Uh, they're already being considered as hate speech. And under the Noahide laws, look it up, N-O-A-H-I-D-E. Under the Noahide laws, um, it's they're going to be banned one day people Matthew 24 Mark 13 there's going to be famines I think it's in the book of Amos it says there's going to be a famine in the land you know not of bread but of hearing the words of the Lord you know and if anybody sends me a uh, a uh, flash drive I'll be happy to copy all all my audios and send them send them to you just you know send me a flash drive you know write me for my address i'm not afraid to give out my address the devils know where i live trust me they've been watching me for a long time a long time back in the uh early 90s they were opening up my mail that came from a certain church that they consider a white supremacist evil racist anti you know what church and uh, they were the ones that gave me my foundation in what the Bible really says find out what the Lord uh, find out what the world really hates the most and it probably is what the Bible teaches you know if the world says sodomites should have the right to get married you better believe the Bible says the opposite so all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In His precious name, amen.